Hi, everybody. I was listening recently to an ABC radio program on background briefings. It was actually taken from the BBC and mainly about false rape allegations. It featured these British rape cases which had collapsed when it was discovered that critical social media evidence had been withheld which could have proved the innocence of the accused men. What was extraordinary about this program was it focused entirely on underfunded forensic services and totally ignored the elephant in the room, which was this huge scandal late last year when it was discovered that police and prosecutors in the UK were deliberately withholding social media evidence as part of a feminist-inspired victim-centred justice. Feminists have long been arguing that such evidence shouldn't be used to let accused men or men accused of rape off the hook. So what happened was a series of rape trials collapsed when it was discovered there had been withholding of this sort of evidence. The former director of public prosecution stepped down and it was announced that re recent rape cases would be reviewed. And wait for it, the Metropolitan Police announced they were ditching the practice of believing all victims. The BBC actually reported that over the past two years there's been a 70% increase in the number of prosecutions in England and Wales that have collapsed because of a failure by police or prosecutors to disclose evidence. The fact that the BBC and our own ABC are now choosing to all ignore all this recent history is just one more example of the way mainstream media denies inconvenient truths which challenge the feminist narrative. Like the evidence from the rape crisis on our campuses, which of course is the reason for my campus tour. To give you a brief update on the fallout from my Sydney University clash with protesters, the university is currently investigating my complaint against the key protesters, um, to determining what actually happened on the night. We'll see if that leads to anything. It looks like I have one more campus tour this year on November 7 at Macquarie Uni in Sydney. I'd love it if Sydney Siders came along to support me. I'll be posting details on my Facebook page and website as soon as they're available. But I'm making big plans for early next year, aiming to cover as many campuses as possible, exposing the frightening truth behind the fake rape crisis which is all about the efforts of feminists to persuade universities to get involved in investigating and trying rape cases. That's just another plank in this push for victim-centred justice. As a stunning illustration of just how dangerous this all is, I'd like you to listen to an amazing talk given at the International Conference on Men's Issues in London in July this year. The speaker, Patrick Graham, is a retired social worker who, along with four elderly men, was falsely accused by a delusional woman of being part of a pedophile ring. This was one of the rape cases which collapsed due to withholding of social media evidence. Patrick tells an extraordinary story exposing the frightening influence of feminism on law systems across the world. Please help me circulate this. Well, it's a privilege to be here, as everybody says, and it is true. Um, I very much, I'm not sure enjoyed is the word, but I've been moved to hear what has been said already, particularly that last presentation by Ian. And I used to be involved in helping men who had been uh, abused domestically. It was a hard job. So this is just going to be my story, really. And I've got some slides which you help to back that up. So at the start of this nightmare, it was actually just a look, a gesture from a police custody sergeant one that I clocked, but I was in no position to do anything about. That was a, a morning, June the 30th, 2016. I'd gone to answer an incredibly unusually early morning doorbell to be faced by three plainclothes policemen who quickly informed me that I was under arrest for allegations of sexual assault between 1990 and 1996. Easy to provide an alibi, as you can imagine. <laughs> they then seized every computing device in the house, including my wife's work computers, phones, iPad, the lot. And then it was an hour and a half's drive in the back of their car to one of my old haunts, Cardiff Docklands, nice modern police station. 
I spent the next nine hours in a stark, solitary cell, in shock, wondering what on earth this could all be about, and who was it who was having this insane fantasy about me? When taken out to be interviewed, the custody sergeant asked me if I still didn't want a lawyer. And I said, maybe one who's an expert in human rights. That was when I clocked the look. He just looked at the policeman on either side of me with a look that said, this schmuck thinks he has human rights. <laughs> that spot's powered me ever since, knowing that that is the culture I'm up against. I sort of expected the police to treat me like a guilty man. That's what they do. That's their job. And I've lived long enough to be familiar with some of the street police in their I'm the boss mode. So I wasn't completely terrified by the situation, but it was traumatic. I could have handled it if it hadn't been the start of the longest and most perverse journey I've yet been on in my life, 78 weeks of it. In all my years working in the mental health field, amongst other places, I've come across plenty of people with borderline personality disorder. It's got a similar cousin, um, but it's much more commonly diagnosed than histrionic personality disorder, which is what I believe my accuser had, has. This rarer form includes as key symptoms in the sufferer the love of a drama, the need to be the lead actor in any drama, and actually to believe the dramatic stories that they themselves have written. They pass lie detector tests. And they love survivors forums. I know enough now and have been badly damaged enough to be absolutely uninterested in ever meeting a woman with that diagnosis again. The nation, UK, as a nation, we should be outraged. In this decade, we have detectives regularly dealing with women describing paedophile rape from over a quarter of a century ago who apparently have no curiosity, no interest in why accusers might not be telling the truth about such things. The situation I was in, emerging from my fog of confused shock, was revealed after charges were made in April last year. Five old men, I was the youngest at 61, had been arrested at one time and all their devices confiscated. The first summary evidence we received showed that a woman had described weekly child rape parties set up by her own father and these descriptions were in interviews led by sympathetic police officers, allowing her to go very slowly with frequent breaks into great detail over 18 hours over, spread over five days. I say led by the police, but the evidence shows this accuser was busy wrapping those detectives around her little finger. During the eight months between being charged and the sudden finale of the court process, I became a member of two groups online, gave essential support, accused.me, which Mike has mentioned, and FACT, and they're both excellent support groups and campaigning organisations. And I mention these because the experience of the five of us, in my case, proves one thing. It can happen to anyone, and I mean anyone. This is just an example. You don't have to have had any of those. Two of us out of the five, in our case, had never even met this accuser. The other thing that can happen, as happened very commonly, suicidal depression, anxiety, insomnia, paranoia, agoraphobia, PTSD, these are just the common conditions reported by members of the support groups that I've been in 
and their partners. I think I'm talking to an audience here that understands the concept of men as victims. But in our country, it's not a role that anyone has ever accepted before, it seems to me. Most in the UK still appear blind to the facts and dismiss the idea that some crazy woman's fantasy of revenge against her long ago deceased father can be so enabled as to wreck the lives of five families so very easily. The wrecking happened on average last year over a hundred times a day. Let me give you some key figures at this point. So there we have it, 41,500 reports made to the police of rape. That's not all sexual assault, that's rape. And yet the Women's Aid, National Crime Survey, Rape Crisis all agree that around 85,000 women were raped last year. I'm not going to dispute that figure, you could dispute it, I'm sure. I want to use their figures. I want to use their figures for a reason. They also say only 10% go to the police. How's your maths? <laughs> 33,000 liars is what Women's Aid and the National Crime Survey are telling us is the figure for how many women went to the police who were not genuine rape victims. I can't get past those figures. <laughs> Someone explain to me what's wrong there. I can't get past them. Surely there's some variations, but anything over 25,000, you start to wonder. So of those 41,000 over, some are so blatantly false that even the police don't believe them and actually no crime them, which means they're not even recorded on statistics from that point on. The Secret Barristers, excellent book, I would say otherwise excellent book, on our broken legal system, unfortunately falls straight into the repetition of the decades-old myth, now completely disproved. And that myth is that false allegations are rare. Secret Barristers says this is clear because only 20 people were prosecuted for the crime of perverting the course of justice for rape allegations last year. Can't a lawyer see the obvious problem with that argument? <laughs> they are talking about how few people are prosecuted for rape. <laughs> 20 out of 33,000. Ever since a false accuser called Eleanor de Freitas was rightly prosecuted for perverting the course of justice in 2014, she committed suicide. Then, since then, the DPP highlighted down here was Alison Saunders, has filtered out all but a tiny few, e.g. those 20. For prosecution, you have to go past the DPP's desk if you want to try and take a private prosecution against someone, as happened in that Eleanor de Freitas case, the CPS will take it over and shut it down. That's what happens. So there is no way that we can take the law into our own hands as you can in almost any other aspect and make your own prosecution. You can't do it. They say it is now not in the public interest to prosecute. Men awaiting rape trials who kill themselves on the other hand, well, they're obviously guilty. That's the line. They're not victims. So, Shall we have a look at what causes this? For example, in my case, Mrs. Anonymous for legal reasons. A big question is, how did she become a false accuser? What clues were there that she might decide to try and put five innocent old men in jail who were virtual or actual strangers? And it would have been until they died. For most of us, that would have been the reality.
Her story, as presented to us by the police, is that she was first raped by her father on her third birthday. There'll be a short quiz afterwards on what you remember from your own third birthdays. Psychologists tell you, no, nobody does. He is also supposed to have cut her vagina with some crude household scissors some point between her third and eighth birthdays. She's not sure when. She didn't submit to a medical examination despite requests. <laughs> Later, at the age of eight, she alleged that her father, who died in 1996, hosted parties virtually every weekend involving drink, drugs, child torture and multiple rapes in a communal com kitchen of a house in which he rented rooms. So it's a house of multiple occupancy where he didn't know all the other occupants. High risk activity, I would suggest. I was a late addition to this fantasy. The others had all been marked down for 15 year potential sentences for multiple types of rape. I got a lesser fantasy of digital penetration. Mark Pearson knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> That sort of fantasy. Much media doubt has been cast on the fitness of the CPS in pursuing cases like mine that include late disclosure of evidence. And yes, we had very late disclosure of evidence. But to me, as a powerful broker of the culture of women as holy victims, the police are actually the prime suspects. On receiving the initial evidence, it struck all our lawyers as one of the stranger aspects of this case. That all these victims' interviews happened in February 2013, and as I mentioned earlier, our arrest was June the 30th, 2016. During that time, apparently, the victim was not in a good enough place to pursue the charges. As I ask in my formal complaint, which is still with the police at the moment, is that really how the law works? Were the police also not in a good enough place to bother to investigate her history, for example? What were they thinking for those three and a quarter years? In 2016, they gave us restrictive bail conditions that reflected their stated belief that we were five in a dangerous paedophile ring. And yet, for the previous three and a quarter years, they were quite happy, doing nothing, letting us live out our paedophile lives. <laughs> My friend Steve, as a GP, myself as a senior social work manager, with vulnerable people every day, and there was no alarm about that whatsoever. I don't think these police have understood the Children's Act. Real detectives who follow the CPS code of practice would have investigated and they would have found that as well as the false accusation of rape that she admitted to making at age 15, i.e. she withdrew it saying she was making it up, there were alleged rapes and sexual assaults by four other individuals completely separate to our case, scattered across the years including by her lesbian lover and her best friend's father. One of these later allegations had actually been investigated by the Manchester Police in 2008 and dismissed as lies about consensual sex. This was not information that was hidden from the police. It was in police files. And if they looked properly at those police files and her medical and counselling notes, as our defence lawyers eventually managed to do, the two detectives would have seen the Manchester CPS officer's description of her as, quote, a sexual predator. As well as records of her regression therapy, uh, there's another story there, <laughs> hypochondria and personality disorder. They would have seen how she had seduced and manipulated every professional helper who allowed her to get close, rejecting them if they confronted any lies. 
What had happened during those five days of interviews in 2013 was that the DC in charge became the latest so-called professional to be seduced and manipulated. And from that point on, all investigations by the police were designed to actively support her fantasies. The cops had fallen for the Goebbels propaganda trick. If you tell a lie, make it huge, the more the people will believe it. When these police officers responded to the Times report on the collapse of our case, January the 19th this year, regarding, as the Times journalist David Brown put to them, the thousand texts, 200 phone calls, and 500 plus emails exchanged with the accuser by the detective in charge, they said, quote, they always support vulnerable victims. And that they had to use these methods as the victim lived in another county. There were five victims. They didn't live in other counties. We were those victims. They were libeling us by saying she was a victim when the court had proven otherwise. Just as an example of the content, which was the point of our complaint about those emails and thousand texts, just as a taster, her emails to her often began, hi hun, smiley face emoticon. I'm not, I see your look of incredulity. I'm not kidding. We saw those emails in the unused evidence that we got two weeks before the trial. Many emails then went into chatting about holidays and exchanging family photos from such holidays. There was one email that actively encouraged her not to pay a bill, which was from a signed contractual um, counselling session, where the police officer said, don't pay it, there's no way she will use the law to make you pay. Now, I don't know about you, but in my social work management career, if I have a social worker who advises a client to break the law, we call that going over to the dark side. <laughs> and the next thing you know, they're on a disciplinary and they will be sacked. There's no doubt about that. The police, on the other hand, who knows? Other emails said, uh, when she was worried about ever seeing us again, <laughs> as if she'd ever seen one of them, never seen him in her life. Um, these men are nothing. That was the police officer's words. These men are nothing, just a bunch of sad old men. This is an unbiased investigator, supposedly. I too had emailed this detective, not a thousand times, trying to get my computers back, which under the law they have to do. And I was polite in asserting my complete innocence and the foolishness of her pursuing this case. After four emails, in a period of 14 months, she wrote to my lawyers, saying that I shouldn't write to her anymore as it was harassment. <laughs> oh, she'd probably try that. It's, um, it's a sad fact. Since about 2000, the new millennium, the police have been set on a way of working that is a complete reversal of what had happened before them. Up until around that time, it was genuine rape victims coming forward who were badly treated. And they were, let's be honest. The police were very dismissive. They would throw them out and say, you shouldn't have worn that skirt, blah, da, 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 don't come back again, end of story. This got broadcast in a TV documentary and there was an uproar. But the response, typical, I suppose, in our society, was for the pendulum to go swing completely the other way. The answer was to believe all accusers. This has led to something far worse than rape victims being discarded with no justice. It's a perversion of the whole idea of equality and opportunity that feminism was supposed to be about. We now had the, the notion introduced of the infallible victim and the assumed guilty man. Infallible victim. That was really what we're talking here. 
and the assumed guilty man. Barristers have now publicly raised this issue, but for some reason none have mentioned this vicious circle that has led to this explosion recently in false allegations. The numbers that we're talking about here are something like four times what they were five years ago. Four times as many false accusations being made is what I would say. They just say recorded incidents. SICA, the Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority, works in a way described by my own MP as shadowy. It is part of the triumvirate of factors that has caused this rise in allegations to shoot to record levels, whilst convictions have barely risen at all. The seeker money is paid out to accusers as long as they sign the forms agreeing to comply with the police investigation. Think about that for a minute. So the police actually help the accusers fill in those forms. Their motto might be, got to have a compliant complainant, except let's say victim, of course. It doesn't matter if the case collapses as a contemptible farce. Ours did. Yet our accuser, she retains her anonymity and her 22,000 of your money. Seek her pay out on the basis of the balance of probabilities. And they assess that balance by saying, if the police have pursued the case, then we believe you too. There's your vicious circle complete. No matter what the result of any trial court case or not even getting to court, they will still pay out. So she is actually one of very many hundreds walking away from a collapsed case with tens of thousands in taxpayers' money. But that isn't even the scariest part. Given the Manchester farce, the case I told you about where she was, it was all dismissed, and her continuing anonymity, what is to stop her going on to make a new set of allegations in a different police area? The Cardiff police didn't look at Manchester records. Why would any other police force look at these records? She's got anonymity. Who's going to find out that she's done this so many times before? So where was the public interest in her not being prosecuted for perverting the course of justice that Manchester time? I can tell you the public interest for us five was pretty strong. That would have saved the taxpayer half a million quid, apart from our five families' lives being a hell of a lot better. So don't let anyone ever try and convince you that there's a public interest in not prosecuting false accusers. There's a very big public interest in it. Since the Savile scandal, juries have had it reinforced that they may convict in rape cases on the basis of believing the accuser. Their testimony is enough on its own. No physical or corroborating evidence is actually necessary. That's in England. It's different in Scotland. This has helped police justify their approach that no other evidence need even be looked for. Some juries are now waking up to the reality that possibly half of rape cases presented involve women who lie about it and who are good at it. So good that false ideas, false data, dodgy statistics have been embedded in public discourse. Back in 1988, research in the USA showed a group of admitted false accusers, asked anonymously, saying why they tried to imprison innocent men. As well as the serial fantasists, like my case, we have the vengeful ex-partners, the family court legal aid seekers, that's Britain, the reconstructed family rift avengers, the one-night affair cover-up merchants, they got caught, and the simple money-grabbing Gemma Beale types, or any combination of the above. 
And this is not strictly a gender issue, I accept that. There are plenty of men who are accused by men of child sexual abuse. Inside Times, the prisoner's newspaper, always includes adverts from law firms asking if they remember being abused in a children's home, as there might be big cash in it for them. But culturally, this is still feminism versus men. There is an ex-prison warder who joined the Accused Me forum. He's worked with Prisoners Maintaining Innocence for 25 years. And he confirms, other research that suggests, there are likely to be at least 1,000 wrongly imprisoned men, or more if you count those on parole, as a result of how police have pursued non-existent sex crimes. This is not the product of a few bad apples, and this is not some files are revealed much too late, and this is not insufficient resources. This isn't the Birmingham Six or the Guildford Four, this is the UK 1000, and tens of thousands of wrecked families among those supposedly cleared. For far too long, our culture has actually regarded men as fair game. People want genuine equality of opportunity, I say, me too. <laughs> People want misandry-based establishment validated victim status. Oh, please, no more. I hope that regarding this disgraceful modern trend, time's up. Thank you.